Hey friends, Sheila here, and today we are talking about climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. I wanted to create a video that is a bit of a one-stop shop for everything you need to know about climbing Kili. In this video, we're gonna cover one, immunizations, medications, travel documents. Two, booking things like flights and guides. Three, what to pack. Four, how to train. And five, what the actual experience is like. Spoiler alert, it's amazing. And hopefully by the end of this video, you'll have a better idea of what you need in order to make this happen for you. Keep in mind, of course, that I am not a professional guide. I have only done this once, so this is just my experience and I am sharing it, but please do your own research to make sure you put together the best trip for you. Let's kick it off with number one, some of those basics you need in order to travel to Tanzania. First of all, you need certain immunizations in order to get into Tanzania. So you're gonna to wanna to see your doctor anyway to make sure your body is prepared for this challenge. But then on top of it, you also need a lot of immunizations. In my case, I was referred to a travel doctor who knew precisely what immunizations I needed, what boosters I needed from immunizations I might've only had as a kid and I also got medications. I got a malaria medication and I got an altitude sickness medication. And then your doctor should also provide you with a little booklet uh, that proves all of those immunizations so you have that as a record. And then of course you need a visa which you can find out all the details on how to get online. So that is one side of the planning, but then there is the other side, number two, which is booking everything. When I fly, I tend to use Kayak. It's a website that helps you find the best deal for whatever flight you're looking for. We flew into Arusha. We stayed at the Impala Hotel overnight. Now for the climb itself, you have to go with a guide. You cannot do it on your own. There are trained guides that will take you up and down Kili. We researched a lot and decided to go with Tropical Trails. They were a much more affordable option and we had a really great experience with them. We've also referred them to other friends who have gone and traveled with them and had a great experience as well. So I can't speak to any of the other guides. All I can say is that that's who we went with and we had a really great experience. Now we're on to number three, packing. So you've done all your bookings, you have all your immunizations and you're ready to go. What do you need to pack? First of all, you need something to carry all your stuff to get to Tanzania. I traveled with my old backpacking backpack, but ultimately it doesn't actually matter what you bring. You could bring a suitcase or a backpack because on the actual mountain, all of the stuff you want goes into a dry sack, which is number two on the list of things that you need to bring. You put all of your belongings in there because then one of the porters will take that and they're carrying that for you. So you're not carrying all your own stuff. You're only carrying the things you need on that particular day. All the other stuff gets carried by one of the porters. So bring a suitcase, bring a backpack, whatever you want. Just bring a dry sack so that you can put all of your belongings into that. Now, the backpack that does matter is this one. This is the one that you are actually carrying. So all your added clothing and equipment is going with the porters, but the things that you need while you're hiking, your water, your snacks, your extra layers, they are all going in here. You also wanna get one that has these handy straps that go around your waist so you're not carrying all that weight on your back because you're walking for a long time. This one also has this nice netting so it keeps it off your back so you don't get quite so sweaty, you know? The next item is super important. It is your hiking boots. Nobody wants to have uncomfortable feet when you're trying to climb up a mountain. I got these beauties from Mech Mountain Equipment Co-op. I love them, they were so comfortable, they aerate, they were still warm. I must have spent like two hours with the guy at Mech trying on every pair of boots they had and walking around in them obsessively. But honestly, be that annoying person because it is way better to test and end up with comfortable feet. And now we get into clothing. You need basically every temperature of clothing you can imagine. So when you start at the mountain, it'll be super hot. You'll want like a t-shirt and shorts. And then as you go up, you'll want a long sleeve and you'll want leggings or pants. And then as you get higher, you want a second layer of pants and a sweater. And then as you get higher, you probably want another sweater. It's just layering is the name of the game. You want every kind of layer you can possibly have. Honestly, if you have like thermal underwear or long johns or anything like that, anything that will keep you warmer the higher you get, bring all of it. You also want a waterproof layer because it's probably gonna rain on you at some point. So I got these pants from Mech again. I wore them over leggings whenever it looked like it was gonna rain. And they're also just durable, which is good when you're sitting on rocks and stuff. And then I got a raincoat, also from Mech. 
kind of getting ridiculous. I swear this video isn't sponsored. I just really like Mac. So you obviously want one that is super waterproof and also get one in a bigger size so that you can wear it over layers. Now we all make mistakes when we go traveling and when we're packing and here's where I went wrong. This is the winter jacket I wore for the summit. I saw this and I was like, you know what? It looks warm enough and you know it's nice enough that I'll get to rewear it again. You know, make sure that money invested in this coat goes a longer way. This was not warm enough. My sister went to Mech and got this giant puffy neon blue jacket. It was ridiculous to look at. She has never worn it since, but she was so toasty on the top of that mountain and I was freezing. Keep in mind that when you're summiting, the temperature is as low as minus 20 and with the wind chill, it can go down to minus 40. When we were there, I think it was minus 33 with the wind chill and I was freezing my butt off. So get a crazy warm jacket. Do not make the same mistakes as me. And then of course you need your undergarments, your bras, your underwear, unless you don't wear bras or underwear. I mean, you do you, my friend. And now we get into accessories. I'll begin with the most important accessory I found, which is socks. Hiking socks feel crazy expensive and it seemed like a big waste of money, but I am so glad I did it. These are the kind of liner socks, so you could wear them on their own. I never really did, but I did layer them under these ones when it got really cold. And these are the ones you wear as you're getting closer to the top because they will keep your feet so toasty. They're also moisture wicking, so they prevent blisters. They're just good all around. Yeah, you need a headlamp. When you have to pee in the middle of the night on the side of a mountain, you want a headlamp. And also you need a headlamp because when you're summiting the mountain, you're doing it in the middle of the night and you gotta see where you're going. You'll also want water bottles and you may want to invest in something like this. This fancy device goes in your backpack and then it hangs at the back of your backpack so you can sip as you go. And then of course you want your first aid kit for Advil, Tylenol, Benadryl, band-aids, whatever you need. One thing I would highly recommend is the blister band-aids. Those are the thicker ones. The last thing you want is a blister when you are climbing a mountain. So do what I did and be really preventative with it. If I felt the slightest rubbing, I would just stop and put on a band-aid. And yeah, you end up with band-aids all over your feet, but it means you are so comfortable, you don't get blisters, just don't let it get that far. And then you need your other basic camping gear, your bug spray, your sunscreen, and some kind of entertainment is good because you have some time in the evening. So cards, a book, a journal. I like to journal, that way you keep track of all the cool stuff you're doing during the day. And you need accessories for a variety of temperatures. Thinner gloves and then thicker gloves that are really warm. Like I said, it gets real cold. A baseball cap for when it's sunny and then a toque for when it's cold. Sunglasses, lip balm, moisturizer. Anything to help you get clean because there ain't no showers on Kili. So wet wipes, washcloth. Your tent will be provided by the touring company. You can also rent sleeping bags. We rented our sleeping bags because you need them to be quite warm. And you might also want walking sticks, but we rented ours. As a random side note, you can pay extra to bring a toilet with you. It is basically a bucket with a toilet seat on it and a tarp wrapped around it. But I tell you, on a mountain, this is luxury. Because you don't know what your digestion's gonna do when you're climbing a mountain, and you don't really want to be dealing with that in the open on the side of Kilimanjaro, you know? So pay a little extra and get yourself that toilet. Hot tip. And also snacks. They will feed you, of course, they have wonderful chefs, but I like to have snacks just to be on the safe side. So that is everything I can think of that we packed. Keep in mind that the tour group you're going with will have weight restrictions. Ask whoever you book with, make sure that you don't bring more than your porters are able to carry. Now we're on to number four, training. Climbing Gilly is not as intense as some other mountains. You don't need to ice pick your way up it, at least the route we took. You are 
are mostly just walking the whole time. And also you're walking slowly because of the altitude. However, it is still a very physically demanding experience. The minimum we walked in a day was five hours, but most days it was a lot more than that. And you feel it in a more intense way because of the increasing altitude. Unless you have a mountain nearby to practice climbing at altitude, you might not be able to get that kind of training, but you can train your body to be prepared for the walking side of things. I highly recommend training and walking in your hiking boots. You want to break those in. At the time, my sister and my brother-in-law and I, we were all training for triathlons. So we were already doing a lot of running and biking and we just, incorporated more walking, especially in our hiking boots as well. Because of that, when we went, we had a lot of endurance strength. So if this experience feels like a lot more than what you do for your physical activity, see your doctor, see a personal trainer, and get yourself to a point where you feel confident in your body's capabilities. And now we're on to part five, the experience of climbing Killy. Honestly, I could talk about this forever. I will try to give you some quick bullet points. Keep in mind, this is a trip I did a few years ago, so things may have changed since then. First thing I wanna tell you about is the amazing people you will meet on your trip. As I said, you have to have a guide in order to climb Killy. What was really astounding to me was the amount of people it takes to get you up and down the mountain. There's a rule that there is one guide for every two people. So for instance, because there were three of us going Going, we had one guide and an assistant guide and then you also have a chef and you have three porters for every one person so in our case there were nine porters going up the mountain with us the guides are amazing for instance our guide his name was Adronis he had been doing this since he was 13 he started as a porter when he was 13 our guides were so kind and so knowledgeable and would answer all of my annoying questions you can learn about wildlife you can learn about history you can learn about their traditions and culture. I mean, you're literally walking for five, six plus hours every single day. So there's a lot of time to chat. The route we took was Machame, Macheme. I'm not really too sure. I'll put the text here. It was a five night, six day walk. When we started, it was super warm. There are really tall trees. It's like this lush forest land. And then the higher you get, the trees slowly get shorter and then they turn into bushes and then they just kind of turn into rocks. And it is quite steep, but you're mostly walking. There are a few sections where there was more kind of a volcanic rock or boulders that you had to climb over. And there was one section called the kissing wall, which is this one section where you have to stay really close against the rock in order to make sure you don't fall. But that is just a very small section. So you're walking for five, six, seven hours every day. Then you get to your campsite and the porters have already gone ahead. So they set everything up for you. You have dinner and then you play cards, read, chat. Then you wake up early, you have breakfast and you head off and do it all again. Now, of course, the best part is summiting. So the day before we summited, we walked for about six hours and then we had dinner. And in theory, we were supposed to go to bed early because you have to wake up just after midnight. I think it was around 1230 that we were supposed to wake up to start the actual summit but I couldn't sleep at all. I think it was probably the altitude. The altitude affects everybody differently. I didn't have it too bad. I got pins and needles a lot in my feet, which was uncomfortable, but that was it. My sister got pretty bad headaches. My brother-in-law got nausea. So it just kind of depends. The altitude sickness medication is there to help, but it's all still a very new experience for your body. So you just don't know how it's gonna react. I think I slept for about 45 minutes before we had to be up to do the summit. And this is after walking for six hours, but just after midnight, we wake up, we have breakfast and we start climbing up the mountain. And this part's really cool because you don't see a lot of people along Killy. You're all kind of doing your own routes, but then at the base camp, that's when you see a lot of other people. So as you head out, it's pitch black and all you can see is everybody's little headlights kind of slowly making their way up the mountain. One thing the guides would say to us all the time was pole pole, which means slowly, slowly. And the whole point of that is that we're not used to dealing with the altitude. And so we're feeling so strong and we just wanna walk really fast, but you need to really slow down because your body is adjusting to the altitude and that is really hard. So you really have to take it easy. This part was a little bit hard for me because like I said, I did not bring the right winter coat and I was so cold. 
and there's nothing you can do about it. It's not the same as when you're in the city and you're cold, but you know, pretty soon you'll be where you're going and it'll be heated and you'll be warm. Literally, you're climbing up a mountain, so your only options are to turn around and give up and you're still gonna be walking through the cold for a few hours or to keep going and it's just gonna keep getting colder. It took us about six hours to get towards the top and for most of it, you're walking through the dark and then slowly the sun starts to come up and when we got to the summit, the sun was kind of like just finally rising. It was one of the most awe-inspiring, beautiful things I have ever seen in my entire life. You're standing on the top of this mountain that you have worked so hard to get to the top of, and there's just fluffy clouds and sparkling snow and this gorgeous red pink sun. I have never seen anything like it. It is such an amazing experience and absolutely worth it to have that moment. So if you get there, take it in, absorb, because it is amazing. And before long, you are already on your way down. And the way you get down, instead of very slowly climbing, which you've been doing for days, we went down pretty fast. And the way you do that is something called screeing. So there's scree, which is like these like little pieces of rock. And you basically step like, like the same motion you would do skiing, but with your feet, through the rocks. So you definitely wanna have really good hiking boots on. So you do that for a couple hours and then you get down to base camp, you have food, everyone's so congratulatory and so warm. We've had a little bit of time to nap, but then we're up and heading further down the mountain. And that is my experience climbing Kili. I hope you found some of it helpful. If you have any lingering questions about climbing Kili, I'd be happy to answer them if I can. So leave a comment in the comments below. Like I said, I'm not a professional climber. This was just something I really wanted to do and that I had the opportunity to make happen. So hopefully this video acted as a bit of a starting point, but have fun researching on your own and putting together the trip of your dreams. If you like this video, please give it a like. And if you wanna be notified whenever I put out new videos, hit subscribe below. Have a good one.